This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask, Lord, that you would pour yourself out in here, among us, within us. Lord, you are the one who opens our eyes so that we may see the world differently. So Holy Spirit, open our ears that we might hear your word. Open our lives, Lord, that we might live into it. Amen. So there is a, a book out that has recently been made into a movie, and it's called The Fault in Our Stars. Has anyone read that? I know it's particularly popular with, uh, with the younger, younger generations. Yeah, so The Fault in Our Stars, uh, it's, it's, a really, it's really powerful in, in some ways. It's, a, it's about a cancer support group, uh, a bunch of, of young folks in a cancer support group. But there's one particular character named Augustus right, Augustus? And uh, I'm getting a thumbs up. And so Augustus, as a character, he is all about metaphor. He's, he loves metaphors, uh, even to the extent that he, he walks around with a cigarette in his mouth. He doesn't smoke. He never smokes it. But he says, you know, as a cancer survivor, I like to be able to hold cancer between my teeth and be victorious. Now, I'm not advocating that you do the same thing. In fact, if anything, I would say cigarettes are probably not healthy. But I do think, I do think that Augustus is right about the sense of metaphor. I think metaphor is a really powerful thing because metaphors take us beyond our words. In fact, beyond that, metaphors actually connect things, pull them together, and bring us up and open us up to a new way of understanding. Does that make sense? When I say that, you know, so here, here in, in Corinthians, when Paul says, just as, just as the body is one, there's one body, but many members of the body, all the members of the body, so too, we are, who are members of the church, we're all different, and we have different gifts, and yet in Christ Jesus, we're made one. Not made the same, because my hand is not the same as my foot, thank goodness, that would make eating cereal difficult, but with the diversity, there is unity. And Paul does that by giving us this image of church that's beyond what is flat in front of us and opens us up deeper to this realm of metaphor. Because you see, metaphors, they capture not just our thoughts, not just the words and the thoughts themselves, but metaphors take us a, steep, a step lower and they capture our imagination. And by capturing our imagination, by ap appealing to visuals and connecting things, metaphors shape the very way that we think. And I think that's really appropriate this morning when we talk about the Holy Spirit. Because you see, the Holy Spirit is never something in Scripture. The Holy Spirit is never set up as something that we approach and then we think about logically and we worship the Holy Spirit. It's, the Holy Spirit is something more alive. In fact, the Holy Spirit captures our imagination, captures our hearts, captures our very soul to the extent that when the Spirit is in us, fruit of the Spirit just naturally happens. You know, Galatians talks about the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. It's not saying these are things you set out to work for and as soon as you earn love and are grateful, then the Spirit comes. Like, no. Scripture teaches us that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes, takes root in us, and then something happens and things grow. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. And so our Pentecost story this morning, with this image of metaphor and connecting, connecting things and bringing them together, again, that's, that's again, that's our image of the body of Christ, connecting things that are different, pulling them together, God, who maybe seems separate from humanity, and yet it's the Holy Spirit who brings us and makes us one with God. Uh, this Pentecost story is full of metaphors, full of metaphors, chock full of them. And for English people out there, I am using metaphor and similes very loosely, so please don't judge me. So, so first of all, I think it's important to recognize that the this, this season of Pentecost, the celebration of Pentecost, that's not new to the Christian church. That's not Pentecost. We celebrate Pentecost in the Christian church, but that was not the first day that Pentecost was celebrated here in Acts chapter 2. Pentecost is a Jewish celebration. 
It's a Jewish celebration of, of, of it's, a, it's a harvest festival. And so when it says that, that the Jews were brought together in one place, that would be similar to folks gathering together for Thanksgiving. It's what you did. And so it's fitting and appropriate and metaphorical, I would say, that this season of Pentecost, the Spirit would come at this season and time of harvest. Because the Spirit came, and then you know the story. Everyone started speaking in languages, and folks heard them, and folks converted to God. They gave their lives to God in this season of harvest. Do you see the metaphor there? No? Do I need to explain it? Yes? Okay. Um, but then you also have this image of being gathered together. The last time the apostles were really gathered together, uh, like Ms. Shannon said, was when Jesus had died. And the disciples gathered together almost out of fear. And they were in this locked room, this dark locked room, and they were, fri- they were frightened and fearful that Jesus had died. Their Savior, their Messiah, their Master had, had died. And so they gathered together to, to be in, in mourning and in fear. And yet Jesus walked right into that room and said, I'm not dead, I'm alive. <laughs> and it was a powerful image. It was a shift. In the same way, the folks were gathered together, not in fear. They were gathered together in preparation. And just as Jesus walked in and, and changed the game, so too did the Holy Spirit walk into that gathered community and change the game. No longer were the doors locked. No longer were the boundaries between God's people and not God's people. That door was unlocked. And the church, the community, was open to a whole new community. They gathered together so that others could gather together. They gathered together to be sent out. It's powerful. And then, too, when we're looking at this story through the image of metaphor, I think it's important to realize that the language itself for this Pentecost story in Acts 2, the language itself is metaphorical. You know, it says that there was a sound like mighty rushing wind. It was, it was like tongues of fire came and divided and sat over every person's head. It doesn't say that a wind, suddenly there was a wind. The, you know, somebody left a door open, a little bit of wind came in. It doesn't say that somebody ran around with a candle and lit everybody's hair on fire. It said that something, in fact, what it's saying is that there was a sound and it caught our attention and we had no idea what it was. And the best thing we can say, it was, it was kind of like this rush of wind. And then we saw something and the spirit happened and something, something happened, like it was, uh, it was like fire came down. Something happened and we can't explain it. But it was kind of like this. I think that, that, is the attitude that we have when approaching the throne of God. This is the language that we have to use when we describe God because God is bigger than our language. You know, just like you can't say, this is exactly what happened on Pentecost. We, no one can sit down and say, this is exactly who and how God is. You know, because even, even if you do have perfect language, if you have the perfect vocabulary to say God is powerful, God is good, God is strong, God is mighty, God is, God is, even if you could craft that with perfect syntax and it was a gloriously descriptive, our words are still too small for God. God is bigger than our language. And I think sometimes we can say, well, we know exactly who God is because God came in the form of Jesus. And that's true. I think God did something special when God came and said, look, here I am. This is who I am. I am, I am Jesus. I am God with you. I am Emmanuel. This is, this is powerful stuff, good stuff. But I think we also really need to be careful because if we say that Jesus of Nazareth is exactly the way God is, then we're saying that God's entity is, is summed up in this tiny racial gendered box. And so I think we need the Holy Spirit in our Trinity. We need the Holy Spirit to remind us that God, God is also like a dove. God descending like a dove. God is beyond human. God is beyond our language. God is beyond our understanding. God is beyond our boundaries of, you know, God is not just an American. God is not just this gendered box. God is not just whatever we have. God is not in our own image. 
In fact, the Holy Spirit almost reminds us that God isn't even just human. God is like a dove. God is like fire coming and igniting and changing and shifting and changing the game. God is more than our language. And so even as we're stretching for metaphors, metaphors themselves remind us that God is still more. But I think there's a flip side to that also, which is, I think, powerful to remember, because just like, just like God is bigger than our language, I think it's also important to remember that God is bigger than our language. And that may not sound very different, but I mean that we can do everything we can to describe God and it's not big, but I also mean that when our words fail us, when we don't have the right words, God is still there. God can go beyond the failures of our language and still be present. One of my favorite chapters is the eighth chapter of Romans. And really, really, please, if you've not read that chapter, it's great. The last couple of verses that talk about nothing can separate us from the love of God, so powerful. But that chapter also says that when, when, when our words fail us um, and we don't have the right words, that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will pray on our behalf with moans and groans too deep for understanding. Isn't that a beautiful image? When we ourselves don't even know how to pray, when we ourselves don't even have enough words to give to God, the Holy Spirit will pray on our behalf. So that means if you're in, a, if you're in that situation when your friend's child has just suffered a terrible tragedy, and you sit there and you say, God, I have, there are no words for this. That's prayer. God is there. The Spirit prays on our behalf. The Spirit connects us to God even without words. On those days when things are going well in your life, when there's that joy, perhaps it's a, a new child in the family or a new graduation, or perhaps it's finding out that you got approval to, to take that test, to take that next step in your job. On days like that when you say, oh, God, I am just so joyous. I am so excited. God, I don't even have the words to praise you right now. That's prayer. The words are there because the Spirit prays on our behalf. And I also think that just as the Spirit connects us to God, the Spirit connects us to one another. So in the same situation, when you are sitting with a friend who is at, you know, when you're at the friend and, and there's not enough words to really tell your friend uh, how much they mean to you, I think the Spirit is there as well. When you're sitting with that friend whose child has suffered that tragedy and you say, and you know there are no words, I think the Spirit is present in those moments too. I think the this, this Spirit of just being present, just being present with someone holding their hand, sitting with them, even without words, is response enough. You know, in the face of grief, I would much rather have someone give me a hug than, than say some sort of platitude to try to make the grief feel better. Because words don't fix grief. But time does. And knowing that you're not alone in grief, knowing that the Spirit is with you, that doesn't fix it, but it helps. It brings healing and wholeness. And I think the other way it's important to recognize that God's bigger than our language is, is when it comes to the big, scary word, evangelism. Yeah, the Methodist Church has a deep, resonant history of, of, of doing evangelism and sharing and proclaiming the Word of God. But nowadays, I think if you ask most Methodists how they felt about evangelism, they would probably admit that it's a little bit scary. Anybody out there say, yes, evangelism, I love it, I do on a daily basis. <laughs> and I, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think one of the main reasons we are so afraid of, of doing evangelism is because we say, well, I, I, don't, have, I don't know what I would say. I don't have the words. I don't know all of the answers. What if someone asks me a question? <laughs> oh, and I think, again, the Holy Spirit is present in places where our language fails us. In fact, Scripture does specifically say that when the Spirit is present, God will give you the words, even if those words are, I don't know. Huh. I don't know how God is three in one and only one, but yet still three. That's a mystery. <laughs> I don't know. But I do know that I have experienced God. I do know that church is a place where people are welcome. 
where the community grows, I have experienced the kingdom of God and it's different. I do believe that this is how God has called us to live. And you see that evangelism piece is important. Because even though we don't have enough words, even though our words are not enough to fully explain God, I still think that we need to start somewhere. That day of Pentecost when the Spirit came with that like rushing wind and that like fire, the proclamation didn't end there, it started there. God's people began speaking in languages they didn't even know. But even then, the miracle of Pentecost is not that poof, the Spirit was there, and poof, people were speaking in languages, and poof, there was crazy sounds and spectacles. The miracle of Pentecost is that through those languages, strangers were able to hear the wonder of God. They looked around and they said, how is it that we can hear the deeds of the Lord in our own language? The wonder of Pentecost is that God was proclaimed. The church proclaimed. And Peter, Peter, you know, when everyone says, look at these crazy people, they're drunk. Peter steps up and says, no, 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 it's not drunk. It's the Spirit. It's the Spirit giving words. And scripture tells us through the, through the words of the prophet Amos, reinterpreted through the lens of Pentecost, reinterpreted through the metaphor of the Holy Spirit, the presence and the realness of the Spirit, Peter steps up and says, this is the day that the Spirit is poured out, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Your men and women will prophesy and speak, and I will tell you, I am grateful that the Holy Spirit speaks in women. I wouldn't be here if I did not truly believe that, and I appreciate the Methodist Church for embracing women in the pulpit as well. But I do think that when Peter says the day has come to dream dreams and have visions from the Lord, it wasn't a one-time event. I think as God's people, we're still called to dream dreams. I think we're still called to find words through the Spirit, to find words to tell others the miraculous deeds of God. And even if that miraculous deed is simply that God loves me, and so because I feel the love of God, I feel called to love others. That's proclamation. That is the good news and the good deeds of God. And so what I'd like to do for just a minute, I would encourage you to take a pencil from the pew in front of you. I know there's a center section of your bulletin that has, there's room for sermon notes. Or, or the back of your bulletin or the margins somewhere. I just want you to take a second and I want you to just ask God and say, all right, God. <laughs> and you may not hear a voice. It may just be a word that, that comes to mind. But I want you to think about if God is calling this church to proclaim, what, what would God be calling this church to proclaim? What is the message of good news? What is the message of, good, uh, of God's gracious deeds that we are called to proclaim to share with others? Does that make sense? Are you on the same page? Okay, take a second. Let's dream dreams and have visions. Our call is to be on fire and share good news with the world. And the Spirit will help us do that. I invite you to stand as you are able and turn to hymn number 539, Spirit of the Living God. Let's make this a prayer for us and for our church. So this week, may the Spirit capture your imagination. May you learn and grow, and may you continue to be a part of a church on fire for this world. And I'm gonna ask you as you leave to find at least one person and share that word, whatever that word was, even if it was just presence or hope or joy or if it was, I don't know, um, I'm still listening. Um, I encourage you and ask you to share that word of God with somebody this week. Can y'all do that for me? All right, we'll go forth in the grace and peace of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.